Now, I'm hoping our wonderful AV team can put up on the screen a picture of me and Lindsay and our dog Pip. There it is. Um, a, um, a congregation member has commented um, that I am growing more and more like the dog during lockdown. Um, I'm taking that as a compliment. It's, it's, a, it's a handsome beast, though, though I, I'm tempted to ask, is perhaps the dog growing more and more like me? And, and if you're beginning to, to draw pictures of animals, you might consider drawing that handsome hound there um, as he, he looks out rather bemused at the camera. That photo was taken last summer, which feels to me a long time ago. I don't know about you, but trying to think back to last summer takes a, an effort of imagination now. And after months of more COVID that we've had, I was speaking to somebody this week and they said to me, I don't know how much more of this I can take. I wonder if some of you, whether you're in the building or at home, are feeling something similar this morning. Well, in our Bible reading from Mark's Gospel, we see Jesus at a similar moment in his life. And it's the night before Good Friday. And as we look at this moment in Jesus' life, it, it will help us face the challenges that each of us faces during COVID. And can I say to those watching online, do use the chat functions on YouTube to share your thoughts and questions as we're thinking about this passage of scripture. And do join me after the service for Zoom Coffee, where we can just talk, but we can also talk about um, the things explored today. Now, we've spent the last three weeks in our series, Walking with God Through COVID, looking at the Old Testament book of Job. It's an ancient meditation on the meaning of suffering in our lives. It's highly relevant to COVID. Next week, Mark will carry on the series and unpack the resurrection of Jesus. And the week after that, Lindsay will finish our series with the New Testament letter of 1 Peter, where Peter writes to a group of Christians in the ancient world who are suffering greatly. But today we're kind of in the middle of this series and our Bible reading shows us Jesus the night before Good Friday. We're between, if you like, the Old Testament with Job and his understandings and we're before the New Testament churches, the communities of the resurrection. And it matters we get where we are in the story, where we are in the plot line of the Bible. For the different parts of scripture have an order to them and they make sense in that order. It's a bit like playing Scrabble. You have a row of letters and you have to put them in order to make a word. And if you leave them all jumbled up, well, they don't, don't mean so much. Now, if you do have access to a Bible, please do turn to Mark chapter 24 or, or uh, chapter 14 um, or scroll down to it on your phone. Verse 32, they went to a place called Gethsemane. Now we need to locate Gethsemane. It was a place just outside Jerusalem. And the word Gethsemane means place of the oil press. Place of the oil press. That's to say a press used to crush olives to make olive oil, which was an immensely useful commodity in the ancient world. It was used for cooking, but also for lighting. It was even used for medicine. So that's the place where the action is happening, but we also need to locate it in time. This is the night before Good Friday, the night before the death of Jesus on the cross, the crucifixion. Jesus, whom the gospels depict as the son of God, is to be executed as a common criminal. Now, the ancient world was a place where 
everybody had a status and the ancient world was really bothered about which kind of layer you were. Were you at the top? Were you at the bottom? And they even had different ways of executing, killing people under law, depending on which status you were. If you were senator, Roman senator, top of the pile, well, you had a kind of refined way of being done in if you committed treason. Crucifixion was for people at the very bottom. It was public. It was prolonged. It was a brutal form of execution for the people seen as wholly dispensable. For the Jewish people, with their view of God coming out of the Old Testament, a view of God as hugely powerful, Jesus dying on the cross seemed crazy. To the Greeks and Romans, for whom the target in life was to achieve a kind of stoical calm in the face of hardship, the cross of Jesus looked messy, distasteful. Three days after Good Friday comes Easter Day, the day of Jesus' resurrection. And at that point, people, the first Christians, suddenly see the cross in a wholly new light. The whole first Christians stop seeing it as a tragedy and see it as a victory. God ransoming humans for the sins of the world. God reaching out to humans offering us forgiveness and a new start. So that's how we locate Gethsemane in the whole plot line, the whole story of the Bible. It's the night before Good Friday, the place of the oil press. Now, that oil, that uh, it, it, it is, is olive oil. It's only produced when huge pressure is applied. And huge pressure was on the shoulders of Jesus that night. In the Gospels, we see Jesus as a compelling, attractive figure, healing, forgiving people their sins, teaching with an authority that put everyone else in the shade, friend to the outcast, advocate to the poor, always on the move, refusing to fit into the boxes everyone tried to put him into. Jesus was called the Lord. That was a title used of God himself. But here in Gethsemane, the Lord is not behaving like the Lord. There is no Zen-like calm about Jesus in Gethsemane. Verse 33, he took Peter, James, and John along with him and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. If you read about the death of great ancient thinkers like Socrates, you find them almost chilled as they meet their end. Outwardly, at least they show a superhuman calm. There's none of that with Jesus, nor is he who has been called divine by his Jewish friends, remotely like the all-powerful God of Moses on Mount Sinai, whizzing thunderbolts around. But look at what he does do. Jesus' response to this trouble is he prays. He takes other people with him. He doesn't go alone. And notice, too, how he expresses the pain that's on his heart. The language is really strong. Jesus is deeply distressed, troubled, overwhelmed to the point of death. So if you are really struggling right now, maybe, maybe what's go, going on in Gethsemane feels like you feel at the moment. In a sense, at Gethsemane, Jesus' destiny comes into focus. He faces square on the depth of the calling God the Father is calling him to. And the horror of one who lives only by his connection with God the Father, facing separation from the Father due to his, Jesus, bearing in himself the sin of the world. 
verses 35 and 36 speak of how Jesus, going a little farther, fell to the ground and prayed that if possible the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup away from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. In his book, God on Mute, Pete Gregg relates a visit to Israel and sitting in a park and seeing a child running back to his father and tripping and falling and banging his knee and then crying out to his father, Abba. This is a term, Abba. It tells us that that incident tells us what this term means. It's expressive of the closeness of parent and child. Jesus prays to God as his father, Abba, in whom he instinctively trusts. And note how this prayer is not going to be answered, at least in the way he hoped. The cup will not be taken away from him. If you have prayed in recent months and felt as if your prayers bounced off the ceiling, Gethsemane tells you, you are in the best of company. The disciples with Jesus are asked to stay here and keep watch, and it's striking that they stayed there and fell asleep. And Jesus commented that the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak, which feels like both a description of them, but also a description of each one of us, uh, not least a portrait of how human beings are under the pressure of COVID when we'll be doing things that we ought not to do. And later in this passage, Jesus talks of falling into the hands of sinners. The spiritual darkness in Gethsemane matches the physical night around them. Gethsemane is about how we do encounter evil in this world. Jesus prayed for the hour to pass from him, but that hour had come. And there is a sense of Satan prowling around the garden. And I think we too can see a sense of how evil is exploiting COVID, not least in these squabbles over the vaccine. Gethsemane has a lot to teach us here in COVID. It is firstly about what we do when our prayers are not answered. We naturally are saying at the moment, why isn't God sorting all this out? Somebody said that to me just this week. And I want to say to you that I believe fervently in the power of prayer. But the idea that if we believe hard enough, God will always answer our prayers as we would wish. Well, that idea has no basis in scripture. The greatest servants of God Think of Abraham and David and hear Jesus himself sometimes pray and do not get the answer they would wish. So that's one thing, a hard lesson in Gethsemane. But beyond that, I think Gethsemane is showing us the depth of God in a new way. Gethsemane shows us that God in Jesus knows firsthand the pain of that humans face. He experiences suffering and we can trust God in the midst of our suffering because he knows it from the inside. That's why the oppressed of the earth, down the ages, right down to the present day, find strength and are attracted to the Jesus of the New Testament for they know him alongside them, alongside us as we fall. This, the God of all history, has also entered history and become subject to its darkest forces. It's like somebody who is the author of the play choosing to actually act in the play themselves and walk onto the stage. And it means that though God can sometimes feel absent to us in our struggles, he only feels, only seems absent, for in fact he is with us in them. 
Now, if you think back to the God we were looking at last week, the God of Job, who was almighty, all-powerful, and mysterious. And once Christians say that God is both that God of the Old Testament, but also the God of the New, then we realize that the New is showing us a dimension of God that is not fully seen in the Old. The more you love a person, the more their suffering, their pain, will touch yours. And you will know if you've had a a family member or friend in real trouble in recent months, how much that, that strikes you at the heart. Now, in Gethsemane, we see something of that in God who is reaching down to us in Jesus. So far had human beings fallen that God has to reach so low to lift us up. And after that, we see that God is no impersonal life force like you might people talk about the force in Star Wars. We do not say of Jesus, if I can rephrase Yoda, the force in him strong is. God is not a kind of sort of impersonal life force. God is with us in the depths of our lives in order to bear in himself the cost of our frailty and failings. And with this comes the distancing of Jesus from God the Father. God the Son is cut off from the Father to bring us to the Father. Jesus is forsaken in order that you and I are never forsaken. In theological terms, we could say that in that Gethsemane shows us both the suffering of God and the sovereignty of God and how we have to somehow hold these together. And if that fries your brain, that's not an entirely bad thing. This is beyond all human reasoning. God has power, but he comes alongside the powerless. And so we can trust him. He is on our side. Now, being sovereign, God is choosing suffering. It is voluntary. He chooses the nails. And by that suffering, Christ is making our suffering no longer pointless. It's no longer random. If God has suffered, then we can't say that he doesn't understand or that he is not close to us. He has not kept himself immune from our pain, so we can trust him. Because Jesus' suffering has meaning, because it doesn't end on Good Friday, our suffering has meaning, even if we can't see it yet. Parents will often do things for their children that the child either either can't understand or, or won't understand. But in a healthy family, the child learns to trust the parent who knows more than they do. How much more do we, should we trust God since he knows far more than we do? And we can trust him because of the cross, because of Gethsemane. Christianity offers no neat explanation for our suffering. But in Jesus' suffering, death and resurrection, it offers a final answer to suffering that God will put all right at the end. More than a restored earth, this is a transformed earth, better than we could imagine. What does all this mean for you and me? I think it means we have a model for how to face trouble, a comfort for when we face trouble, and a hope for our troubles. We have a model for how we face trouble in the person of Jesus in Gethsemane. Look at how he refuses to become isolated in his anguish. He stays connected with the disciples. He brings them with him. Look at how he readily prays. And look at how even when that prayer is not answered, he keeps trusting in God all the way through. Here is a model for us as we journey through COVID 
as we deal with the furnace of COVID, that we need to stay connected with others, that we need to keep praying, that we need to keep trusting in God our Father. And that way we will not be consumed by the bitterness of this furnace. We have a model for how to face trouble and we have a comfort as we face trouble. Because Jesus faced trouble alone, we no longer face trouble alone. He is with us in the fire. There is a great story of the Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was imprisoned for years in a Soviet labor camp, uh, camps from which many would never return. And there was one day when he was at a particularly low ebb, facing grinding, backbreaking work day after day, and a fellow prisoner came alongside him and uh, traced the sign of the cross in the dirt on the ground. Jesus is with us in the mess that we find ourselves in. We do not have a savior unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. That's what Gethsemane is saying. We can know him even in the depths. So we have a model for how to face trouble and we have a comfort when we face trouble and we have a hope as we face trouble. Gethsemane is bad. But it is not the end of the story. That's the key thing, relocated. It's in, not the end. The story has more chapters to come. The, suf the suffering we experience now is not the end. In Christ, there is more ahead. Let me finish. Jesus in Gethsemane is showing us how to walk through COVID. He's showing us that we need to walk via the cross. And this will help us as we face the coming months. And it suggests you might look forward to the 2nd of April, that's Good Friday this year, and sort of mark it, circle it in the diary, and walk towards the cross. And that will help us in these difficult times. Gethsemane shows Jesus to be, if you like, the ultimate Job, the ultimate servant of God, assaulted by Satan. Gethsemane shows us that when we suffer, we can know Jesus is with us, walking the path we are treading us, meaning we are not alone on that path, a meaning that suffering cannot keep God from us. Amen.